محمد القائد الأعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد والمؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء بعض Dear brothers and sisters and respected guests, we are very grateful for the opportunity to be able to offer you a window to Islam and to ask you the question, what do you know about Islam? And we mean, what do you what do you really know about Islam? Not what you've heard about Islam and not what you have read in the newspapers, not what you have seen on television, not what your teacher or your professor said about Islam, not what your neighbors or your friends said, or what the priest or the minister of your church said, but what, what you have come to understand from basic facts, historical, scriptural facts about the system of life which is called Islam. Not even necessarily what you have witnessed through the behavior of some Muslims, because I don't think I have to tell an objective person that a Christian is not necessarily an example of the life of Christ. And a Muslim, therefore, is not necessarily an example of the faith that he or she might claim to embrace. To be fair and objective, such sources of information about Islam or any other faith would not be an acceptable source for judging or understanding anything or anyone. Why then are so many people convinced? And why are so many people standing in judgment about a subject that they have very little information, if any, and very few actual facts about? 
The strangest thing is that Islam is a system of life, a global faith that one could know very easily by going to the sources. And the Quran has two sources. One is a scriptural source, which is the Quran. And the other is a human source, which is the life of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. In the same way, we could make an objective investigation into the life and message of Jesus Christ and that would allow us to know if we want to call ourselves Christians how we could follow the life and message of Jesus Christ look directly to his message called the evangel or the good news and look directly to his life and his behavior this will tell us what it is to be a Christian if we want to use that terminology. Now I realize that some people came here this evening to contend with a preconditioned mind. Having done some preparation which they may consider to be a critique of some sort. And that's okay. That's fine. But my presentation this evening is not for those people. They're welcome to listen. And given the opportunity, they're welcome to put forward their constructive criticisms. But my message this evening is for those people who came here with an open mind, an open heart, because only an open mind and an open heart can receive anything. You try it as an example. Turn a glass upside down and see if you can pour something into it. You cannot. Additionally, I ask you, Open your mind and open your heart for a moment, if you dare. Set aside your preconditioning. Set aside your prejudices, those that were given to you by parents, by institutions, by your own set of faith or values. Set that aside for a moment and listen. I promise you, we won't take you hostage. We won't make an attempt to brainwash you, although some human beings could stand some brainwashing. But what we will try to do is to provide you with a simple, open, candid window to Islam. Now, Islam is a faith system. Some may want to refer to it as a religion, and it might be appropriate to do so. But in my discussion with human beings, religion as a word in the modern world has some negative connotations and restrictions. So I don't prefer to use the word religion. I prefer to use the word faith or life system. Now as a faith and life system, Islam is based upon basically five pillars. Those five pillars are very simple. We bear witness that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, Almighty God. The fact that we use the word Allah doesn't mean that we believe in a different God than that of Christians or that of Hindus or Buddhists or that of Jews. No. 
There's only one creator. There's only one source of creation. There's only one source and origin of existence. And for us, we bear witness that this is Almighty God. Such a bearing of witness and such a declaration is the same declaration of Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Isaac, Jacob, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, and of course the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Your God, my God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We use the word Allah in the Arabic language because the word, uh, the letters A-L is a definite article. It means the, only, exclusive. And La means God, object of worship. So when you put them together, Allah, it makes it very clear, concise, and exclusive that we're speaking about the only. Lord, God, sovereign, creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it. This is not the God of the Muslims, not the God of Muhammad, some special God of the Arabs. It is the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything which is in it. We bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. And why do we say that? Because by saying that, we are admitting that there was a chain of prophets. Not one, not the final, but a chain of prophets. Some whose na names that we would know, and some whom's, whose names we may not know. And these prophets and these messengers were extraordinary human beings. They were not ordinary human beings. Yet they were human beings. None of them were gods. Fathers of gods, sons of gods, daughters of gods, relatives of gods. They were all human beings that ate and slept and drank and lived and left this life. From Adam the first, man, God, messenger, the first man and God's messenger and prophet, Adam. Your common father, my common father. The first man whom God created, whom God put upon this earth, whom God taught him some knowledge, whom God tested, and whom God caused through him and his mate, our common mother, Hawa, or Eve, as is known, to procreate. And here we are. From Adam to Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Isaac, Ismael, Jacob, Zechariah, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, up to Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Many more that we could name, but that it would not be necessary for us to do so. We believe in all of those prophets and their divine mission. That is, they did not come and sometime in their life they figured out they had something to do. And therefore they wrote a book. Or they woke up one day and they had this burning feeling to deliver a message to the human beings. No, it is our belief that every prophet and messenger was sent by Almighty God, selected by Almighty God, for his message as a prophet to deliver a message to a particular people and for those that doubted to prophesize and to demonstrate phenomena that we may refer to as miracle for the doubters, for the challengers, to exhibit miracles so that those doubters, those challengers would know that verily, that human being is in fact a selected, chosen person of God. We say Muhammad is the messenger of Allah because it is our conviction 
that Muhammad, his messengership, his prophethood is a natural progression and a finalization of prophethood. And that he was prophesied by Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. And that he confirmed through his revelation and his conduct, the life, the message, and the mission of Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. We say Muhammad Rasulullah, peace and blessing be upon him, because it is our conviction that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, his life, his mission, and his message is this, the most profound for any human being whose life has been categorically recorded. And I'll repeat that, whose life has been categorically documented and recorded. And we'll come back to that statement. Later on, we'll come back to that statement. I want you to remember that statement because I'm sure there are those who came here with a pocket full of challenges. And I got a few for you too. Islam has five fundamental pillars, the first of which is to bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, consistent with the first commandment given to Moses, consistent with the first commandment that Jesus Christ also said is the greatest of the commandments. Hear you, Israel, the Lord thy God is one, absolutely one, not the number one. Not the number one that could be divided into one, two, three. Not the number one that could be multiplied. But absolutely one, having no one besides, no other God besides. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul, and thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God nor bow down to any graven images in the heavens or the earth or the sea below. Such said Moses, and such said confirmed Jesus Christ, and such said the Quran. This is what we bear witness, and this is the first pillar of Islam, and the most important. The second pillar of Islam is to adopt the attitude and the habit of worship not thinking about God, not reflecting upon God, not merely meditating upon God, not just talking about God or singing about God, but worshiping God with a liturgy, with a formula, with a ritual that God ordered the prophets, peace and blessings be upon all of them. Now this is very important for us to understand that in Islam, we follow a prescribed liturgy it would be referred to in some religions, a prescribed act of worship. Five times a day, the Muslims wash and stand and bow and prostrate and call upon God with specific words, asking for mercy, asking for guidance, asking for strength, asking for forgiveness, asking for knowledge, asking for sincerity. But it is not an abstract bowing, standing, prostration. It's not something how I want to do it or how you would like to do it based upon my whim or my feeling or my abstract desire. No, it is a specific ritual of worship. For certainly, those of you who, who are educated, you have a specific protocol attached to your profession. And you proceed to execute your, process, your profession with a procedure, ritualistically. And you have guidelines and you have protocols, how, when, what, where, that you do it. And from time to time, you also have to get training to upgrade. How then do the human beings think that they are more intelligent, more demanding amongst themselves, that for their profession, for their efficiency, for their proficiency, that they have established rules, rituals, protocols to address their administrators, their presidents, 
their family, their parents, their teachers, their professors. There are protocols, but God doesn't deserve a direct protocol. We can just think of God, meditate upon God. We can just sing about God. We can dance about God. We can whistle and clap. Or each one of us individually adopts our own way of worshiping gods. As if the prophets of Almighty God who were sent as messengers and prophets and guides and examples, they were not given a specific ritual system by which to communicate and to worship Almighty God. We reject that. We reject that completely. For if we examine the scriptures, we find that every prophet of God, every single prophet of God had a specific ritual, a manner of prayer, a time of prayer, a mode of prayer, words, special words in which they used to communicate with Almighty God. And each one of those prophets also, they did not speak to people or choose to guide people with their own words. Always the words they use to guide people and call people were words of scripture, which means divine revelation. Divine revelation. It means whatsoever they heard from God, whatever God inspired them to say, that's what they said. Such was the Torah of Moses. Such was the commandments of Moses. Such was the books of Abraham. Such was the Psalms of David. Such was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And such was the Quran revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. We Muslims are also ordered by Almighty God to take a portion of our wealth Wealth, and in Islam, wealth has a definition. The definition of wealth is what is what remains after you fulfill your needs. So Islam has a legislative definition of wealth. So whatever wealth that a Muslim has in their house, in their bank, which, they, which is owned by them, that amount of wealth that is sustained over a period of a year, whether it be $1,500 or $15,000 or $150,000, whichever amount of excess property or wealth that a Muslim sustains for at least one year, within that year, the Muslim has to pay 2.5% of that as a charity. It's not much. It's a symbol. It's a gesture. It's a contribution. It's a reminder that you have been endowed by Almighty God with what you have, and there are others that you owe a part of that endowment to. It's called zakat. And so the Muslim has been ordered. This is not optional. It's mandatory to pay this 2.5%. The fourth pillar is fasting during the month of Ramadan. Now the month of Ramadan is the ninth month of the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar. And in case you have a problem with that terminology, it means the calendar which is calculated by the movement of the moon as opposed to the movement of the earth around the sun. So we have commonly in the world today the Gregorian calendar and we have the lunar calendar. And there is a difference between the two. In the course of a year, the lunar calendar is 10 days shorter than the Gregorian calendar. It's not just a matter of choice. It's a determination that came to us from God and from revelation. And in the ninth month of the lunar calendar, the Muslim has been ordered by Almighty God to fast. Now fasting for us means abstaining from food and drink and sexual relationships. 
from the time of the light of the dawn until the setting of the sun. Not a long period of time, but a significant enough amount of time for the human being to learn discipline, self-control, and to develop a feeling, a feeling of hunger and denial similar, not the same, but similar to other individuals throughout the earth who are fasting involuntarily. Now this ninth month of the lunar calendar also coincides with the time that the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, 1,424 years ago. It was in the month of Ramadan that the Qur'an was revealed, that the angel Gabriel came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and said those words, read in the name of your Lord, recite in the name of your Lord. Those five verses that came to us that began the revelation of the Qur'an and then culminated over a period of 23 years. So when we fast in the month of Ramadan, we do so because we consider it to be an order, a mandate from God, and that it is also a means by which to teach us self-discipline, self-control, sacrifice, denial. And during that month, we are spending more time reading the Quran that was revealed during this month memorizing the Qur'an that was revealed during that month, reflecting upon the Qur'an, and standing in prayer while that Qur'an is recited. This is the significance. There are many benefits for fasting. Many benefits. The people in the medical community can tell us. People in the psychological community can tell us. But that's not the reason why we fast. We're fasting because it's an order from God. And that fasting also is a discipline that all the prophets of Almighty God, they did. They exercised. The fifth pillar of Islam is performing the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mecca is a city in the Arabian Peninsula. A city that from time immemorial was known to be a sacred city in other scriptures, it was referred to as Becca, or it was referred to as Paran in the Old Testament. A place where Abraham, the patriarch, our common father, the patriarch Abraham, a place where Abraham took his wife and his son by the order of Almighty God and settled them there in a desolate valley. And after some time, Abraham returned back to that desolate valley where he was ordered by God to leave his wife and son. And there, in that desolate valley, Abraham built a building which is called the Kaaba. Kaaba in Arabic means cube. Kaaba means cube because it was a square-shaped building, a very simple building, a building maybe 18 feet, 20 feet high, and maybe 18 feet or 20 feet on each side, a simple building, not a building that God lives in, nor a sacred building itself, but something made of mud and stones, but a building that was ordered by Almighty God for Abraham to build and then go around it commemorating God. Not worshiping the building, but worshiping God, but setting up that building so that human beings would come from all over the earth and do what? Circumambulate around that building and praise Almighty God and call upon him with forgiveness and mercy and repeat the oneness and the glory of Almighty God. This Kaaba all Muslims repeating this tradition of Abraham, reliving this tradition of Abraham. Every Muslim from wherever they are, China or Russia or Africa or America or Australia or from South America or wherever Muslims are, they have been ordered once in their lives, if they are able to do so, to go to Mecca and to experience the universal fraternity 
and to experience the tradition of Abraham. These are the five pillars of Islam. And Islam is built upon these five pillars. And each of these five pillars form the basis for the Muslim discipline, the Muslim ideology, the Muslim's relationship with Almighty God, and the disciplines that begin to shape and form the spiritual structure of the human being. Included in our faith system is the belief in angels. We believe in angels. We believe that the angel Gabriel came to all the prophets of Almighty God, and that is the archangel of God. We believe that. We believe in all the divine scriptures. We believe that Almighty God. We believe that God would create human beings and that he would not leave human beings without inspiration, guidance, a manual, no more so than any one of you would set up a company and create some machinery and people that work on that machinery and then market that machinery and not send along with that machinery a manual. And not also make available to those that purchase that machinery a technician. No one would buy an automobile or a toaster, a computer, or a telephone without asking for a manual or having some kind of a service number to call a technician or a warranty. Everyone would ask for it and everyone would expect it. And we think that the creator of the heavens and earth, who is the designer of everything and has created man as the ruler of this planet, the most sophisticated creature on this planet, would not communicate with man through man and give to him a manual by which to follow and send along with that manual prophets and messengers to act as technicians to explain to man that manual and the relationship of the one who sent. So we believe in divine scripture. We believe in all the prophets and messengers as extraordinary human beings sent by God. We believe in the day of judgment. We do believe, certainly, that life is very short. 60 years, 70 years, 100 years, or even in the case of Noah, 950 years. There's no doubt that human beings will die. Every single one of them will die. And if there's anyone here that's outside of that reality, they certainly have no need to hear this lecture because they're more exceptional. They're of a different species than we are. And since we know that we will die and we know that we came into life and we know that we were created and this life was designed and that this life is restricted and that this life has a purpose, that there is some accountability for this living. Four, how would any one of you not think that there was accountability for life, but think there is accountability in your workplace? You have a supervisor, there's accountability there. You have children and they are accountable. Teachers have students and they are accountable. So there is accountability in every area of life. How then would we think as human beings that we would be created and live and given the gift of choice, volition, and there would be no accountability. There is accountability. That accountability according to scripture is that the creator of life and death has the ability to bring the human beings back to judgment even after their dust and bones. Now those of you who are intelligent, sophisticated, who would think that to be an impossibility or just some kind of a theory, well, I call your attention to take a look at the earth. From time to time, the seasons change. 
And you see the earth, one time, is full of life, blossoms, fruits, greenery. Then the season change, and the earth is barren, bearing no fruit at all for some time. And then rain comes from the sky, and the earth is energized, brought back to life with new fruits and new grass and a new season. It's not the one who created the heavens and the earth who is able to do that. It's not the one that created the human beings from the very beginning able to do that. It's, the, it's not the one who created everything from water able to bring that water, that human being, or that earth back to life after it was dead. We say yes, definitely. The one who is the creator of the beginning has the ability to create howsoever he pleases. We believe that Almighty God and only Almighty God has the decree. To do whatsoever he pleases and gives to human beings a small amount of decree. That is, you and I, we do have the choice to accept or to reject. We even have the choice to take our own lives. It is not our right, but it is our choice. We have the choice to earn our living in a dignified way, or we have our choice to earn our living in an immoral way. We have a choice between right and wrong. We have a choice to be decent, dignified, and honest. Or we have the choice to be criminals. But the choices that we have, so many that they are, they are limited, definitely limited. They're limited in time. They're limited in scope. They're limited in number. Why? Because the human being is not a creature that is born with unlimited anything. And finally, we believe, as the Quran sets forward for us, that inevitably, man has been created and put on this earth only for a test, a determination, to give him or her the opportunity to perform, to display, to obey, to acknowledge, to submit, to pass a test. And after some time, you will be taken out of this earth, you will be judged, and then you will be given a new life in a different place according to the actions that you did. Now we understand this in earthly terms. We understand that criminals, when they are indicted and convicted, we understand and we accept that criminals are placed in jails. We understand that a human being, if they are diagnosed, with some disease, we place them in a hospital. Once they are diagnosed, they're put there for treatment. We understand that. We understand also that we go to school to graduate and that we work to get paid. We also understand that we are all striving for happiness. Ultimately, every human being wants happiness. Almighty God said, ultimately, happiness is not on the earth. You will not achieve ultimate happiness on the earth in the same way that a murderer, a mass murderer, will not receive ultimate punishment on the earth by his fellow human beings. Cannot. There's another ultimate punishment, and there's an ultimate reward. The ultimate punishment is hellfire. God is